We are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Very, very excited to, oh my God, I know my voice cracking. <laughs> Second puberty. Uh, very, very excited and honored to be sitting here with Shiran J. Zhao, and we are going to be discussing their latest blockbuster of a novel, which is Zachary Ying and the Dragon Emperor. Beautiful, stunning. Oh. Yeah, what the is cover art by Valency. I die every time I look at it. Okay, so we were actually going to ask because similar vibes. Is this the same cover artist? It is not. So Iron Widow is by Ashley McKenzie, and then the Zachary Yin one is by Valency. But I am very unfortunate because both my publishers listened to my pub um, cover opinions. Like they sought my advice, they sought my opinions on like what kind of cover I would like um, before going to the design phase, which I know that it's it's pretty rare for authors to have an opportunity. But yeah, I am I'm really grateful that my publishers asked, and then they re respected my cultural notes for like the things that I wanted on there. Mm. And so for Zachary and I was basically like, yeah, I have a pretty strong vision for the cover. I want Zach and the first emperor just in action poses on the cover. And then mm -hmm. there's this water dragon behind them. And that's exactly what they did. So I, I yeah, I'm yes. really grateful. Yes, yes. And for anyone who for some wild reason hasn't seen the stunning cover, this, these are the details of, that they're talking about. We out of the two, because we did not think we could love any cover more than Iron Widow, but Zachary Yin is giving. Like I know, right? When I first saw it, it just it blew my mind. I could not believe what I was seeing because mm -hmm. I never saw any um like mm -hmm. in process pictures. They just my editor yeah. just uh, emailed me the final version, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Bet yes, yes. Um, please don't uh kick me out of this live stream, but get it it blue your vine oh my god <laughs> i'm so sorry i'm oh so sorry that we are as an entity i'm just like leave studio <laughs> I, know, I was like please don't leave <laughs> that would be a record breaking like okay it took two minutes for yeah no well. we have an exact time and that's my time all right gotta go gotta go people folks are very very excited we are very very excited um and so just to kind of give a give a rundown on on how uh we want to structure this interview basically uh we've got some 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 questions about zachary Ian, and um we would love to open like last 10 15 minutes for readers if they have any questions um for you and then of course like prior to us hopping into uh, audience questions, if there's anything further that you want to expound upon, we um, will obviously have time to do that. Okay. But, okay, so um, let's just let's just hop right into it. I am like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you. So the the first thing that we we just wanted to touch upon is like, you have this incredible knack. Like, I feel that you are so very, very much well known for this incredible talent for writing plot twists. And it is, it is so heart shattering <laughs> in the best way to get to the end of, of one of your books because it's just like the way that you can twist the story upon the reader is so it's just so seamless but while you see the pieces that are there you know when you look back you're like okay this makes sense but you still manage to have that element of surprise how do you do that <laughs> like how i don't know and i think um i was less mean in zachary Ann than i was in iron widow because iron widow that was like one plot twist every five pages for the last 50 pages but yeah. for zachary Ann, i was less mean so mm -hmm. That is that is true. I feel though that in Zachary and you had some you had some heartwarming plot twists. You know, there were there were some really touching plot twists that you're like, okay, this is great. But let's but let's we're not gonna let you off the hook. That cliffhanger. <laughs> okay, now the cliffhanger. We were like, ooh, yeah. And, <laughs> and that was actually one of the questions we wanted to ask is because because you know you are a reader. You know that readers cliffhangers are very polarizing um 
readers either love or hate cliffhangers. I'm a cliffhanger lover, you know, myself. Were you at all nervous, especially, you know, with Iron Widow and with Zachary and were you nervous about the cliffhangers? Not really, because honestly, I thought I was like not that mean in Zachary Ann. For Iron Widow, I was like, okay, so either you're going to love this or hate this. But for Zachary Ann, I'm just like, here it is. Just if you want to find out what happens next, to read this, read the sequel that comes out in like a, a year or something. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, it's um it's it's always been interesting to us because even if the cliffhanger isn't isn't mean per se, like like you know, as you say, in Zachary and it's not it's not a torturous cliffhanger. You know, it's something that makes you excited for the next book. But in in our experience, just being on booktube and just hearing other, you know, readers' perspectives on, on how novels end, it it seems like 50% of readers are like, I don't care if you're building anticipation. I just want like I I I want it all compact and for and for us we're like no like drag us like you know what I mean get us excited um but okay cool so you were like nah I, I wasn't being that mean with Zachary and y'all gonna be okay like yeah look y'all okay. gonna be okay okay <laughs> <laughs> okay bet um and so moving on to discuss the technology because Holy wow. And and before we forget to say this, we want to make sure that we say that you are also a master crafter of science fiction and fantasy. You just sew those those two lines together like poetry. It is so beautiful. Get it? So beautiful. Oh my sorry. God. No, sorry. Sorry. Don't leave studio. <laughs> that one was not planned. <laughs> These are just oh my gifts. god they're just gifts from the ancestors you know we can't yeah we can't I know. responsibility for for what the ancestors provide um no sorry uh before i was a, a dad so how do you construct such seamlessly believable worlds um such as like the portal lens technology that you're using in in zachary in zachary in I just really like it when like magic and technology intersect in stories. So this story, um, this book is heavily inspired by Yu-Gi-Oh, <laughs> and um, what I loved about Yu-Gi-Oh was the way that it you know merged technology and magic. Because Yu-Gi-Oh, the card game, it was supposed to be this like ancient Egyptian ritual uh, to summon um, to summon like monsters from the depth of the human heart. And then Pegasus saw it on like a bunch of ancient Egyptian uh, tablets, and he was like how about I make this into a children's collectible card game? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and then Seto Kaiba got the idea to make the hologram technology to like materialize the monsters after he was in a game with Yami Yugi and the Yami Yugi like uses magic to make the monsters real. And Seto Kaiba was like, okay, that's really cool. Like I don't have magic, but I want to make that a real thing. So he created the hologram technology. And I just mm -hmm. really love it when like the science-y characters um, are able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Just like, like use science to hack magic to like recreate the same effects because mm -hmm. yeah i'm super mm -hmm. fascinated by how um they intersect because nowadays i constantly when i'm using technology i feel like you know if i like went back in time um i, I could like blow some like um 1700s french peasant's mind with this i mean <laughs> they would think it's magic mm -hmm. I mean, especially if you were to go back in time with your biochem degree knowledge, oh, you know, sure. I feel like I feel like it's possible. I mean, you, you saying that we feel like um, personally as some, so backstory, we're very, very spiritual. Um, our family is, is very, very deeply spiritual. And and personally, what what we believe in, especially in our family, but in ourselves, is that um in terms of magic, magic can be studied on a scientific level. We just don't have the we just don't have the knowledge to do so yet. You know, magic, and so um, that's part of the reason why we get really geeked about about Zachary and, and novels like this that kind of bridge that connectivity between between spirituality and you know traditional magic and science and how science can be used to create that bridge. Um, like, of course, this this is you know a fictional novel, but it, everything is fiction at one point. And you touch on that in this book as well, it, it about how it is us, our consciousness, the, um, the, the legends that we create surrounding legends that then pulls those, those legends into being. 
Um, sorry, that was just like a big rant. Basically, yeah. the sci-fi fantasy is amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm so glad that you liked it because yeah, I, I am. I'm totally like a total geek about that too. Bet. So, of your two novels, which would you like to see the most adapted? Wait, which I most think, would you like to be adapted? I <laughs> think that Zachary Yen would make a really cool um, animated series. Uh, Iron Widow, I am I am not sure. I think Iron Widow will be like a lot harder to adapt, but I am sitting on some news that I can't share publicly yet. So Ooh. maybe it will be an adaptation of Iron Widow on screen at some point. Right. Who knows? Maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> perhaps one day. <laughs> Please, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, that is amazing. So before we we want to talk about how this book, Zachary Yen, is essentially a video game nerd's dream. Um, yeah. and, and especially, you know, how you, how you, you speak about the inspiration for Zachary Yen being, uh, being Yu-Gi-Oh! But also just the way that the, the technology shows up and how it's utilized by these kids and the references is, is very much like, like, this is a book for video game nerds, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, I, I hate to say it, but just never got into video games outside of like <laughs> Crash Bandicoot and Sonic the Hedgehog, like play those to this Oh day. my God. <laughs> no, actually me neither. Like um, I am actually not a gamer, despite what this book might suggest, but I am very, mm -hmm. um, all my friends are gamers. Like, like they won't shut up about video games. Me, mm -hmm. all I played was um, Tomb Raider, Sea World Tycoon, and, but I liked MMOs. I really liked MMOs like uh, Toontown and Mabinogi. So you'll see a lot of MMO influence in Zachary, mm -hmm. but still mm -hmm. I'm only like adjacent to the video game world. I'm, I'm not a, I don't consider myself a gamer. Sure. Okay. So the that was what yeah that was one thing that that we were curious about when reading this because the it's just you you just write it so well and um, even like the reference to Leroy Jenkins that killed me because yes. I and it was so embarrassing because like so I'm thirty so I remember when that when that happened you know and yeah. um, and I remember it specifically because I had a friend who always played lol and like i would pl i would just sit there and just watch um and so that's like the only reason that i even understand the leroy jenkins reference but when it was referenced in the book i was like man i don't recall this historical figure and then, oh my god <laughs> i was so angry <laughs> when i was like oh my gosh of course like that's so embarrassing but just like the way you do that so much in this book you take um, like modern pop cultural figures and you you either like write them into legend or or you kind of just show what could happen with these figures in the future as they are you know essentially like immortalized through fiction and so um or mythos rather and so we were curious about why you decided to to write about that no, it's because I totally believe that superheroes are just American mythology. And um, the way we treat superheroes also makes me super curious about like how they actually perceive the gods back in, you know, the old days, like the Greek and Roman gods. So like, did they, were they aware that like um, the, the legends of the gods were uh, man-made or were, did they like think they were real people? Cause like, we certainly don't think that superheroes are real, but we um, act, like we'd speak about them as if they are real and then mm -hmm. they still have a like very in real influence on our lives so i mm -hmm. i truly do think that american uh, yeah superheroes are american mythology and then that whole concept just fascinates me a lot and mm -hmm. then this book it is a deeply chinese american book so it has like all sorts of um chinese cultural references like from pulling deeply from chinese history and culture but i also have a bunch of american pop culture references because you know zach is an american kid mm -hmm. and like so essentially these emperors are like uh how do you do a kid while making these pop cultural references not how do you do <laughs> yeah how do you do zach <laughs> it's uh so there's actually a quote on page 146 that that touches exactly on what you were just saying it's um and it's one of our favorite quotes in the book it's um we stopped trying to decide what's real or not real a long time ago. So believe what you want. 
it just might be true or become true. Yeah, right. so yeah, that's the whole legend magic system in this book. Mm -hmm. um, the other two kids who have way more experience um, in this, they're just like, yeah, you know what? Anything can be real. We don't know like when like Batman's ever gonna manifest next to next to our mm -hmm. emperor. So like whatever, like just yes. power of the mind. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely think um, they they are like pretty spiritual, and then that ties into how Chinese folk religion works because like. To the Chinese pantheon, it's not set in stone. Gods can be added to the Chinese pantheon anytime. Just random historical figures just like evolve into these gods. Um, just because lots of people believe that, like, start mm -hmm. to worship them as gods. So it, it's super flexible. And, you know, it takes influence from all kinds of religions. They, uh, Chinese folk religion doesn't really discriminate. It takes from Buddhism, from Taoism, um, mm -hmm. technically from Confucianism. But yeah, the whole concept of religion, it's just different from uh, the three Abrahamic ones where they tell you that, you know, you can only like worship this God and you have to like exclude all other religions, but that's not really the case in China. Um, mm -hmm. China is all like, whatever, like anything might be real. So party. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. It, and we, we are um, by no means as educated into in, in history as you are. But we would imagine that a big part of that, like, like how, for example, um, in in China, those beliefs are allowed to coexist. Versus mm -hmm. when you look at the West and uh, the United States, how that idea of coexistence, especially with like Christian Crusades, and I mean, you, you I think you know where I'm going with this is like, the West does not allow that. You get you get Christian God, you get Jesus. Yeah. You know, and um, mm. which has caused a lot of a lot of toxicity, right? Like a lot of um, horrible, horrible things have come from that way of thinking. This thinking, this this idea that um, not everything can be true, and that we can't all our our beliefs can't coexist. Um, and so that was just like one of the the things about about Zachary and that that I really, really enjoyed, especially too, because you you speak about this in the novel that it's essentially, um, it's, it's especially important for Chinese diasporic children to be allowed to be who they are, especially um, like with, with so many of, um, how do I put this, with so many of, beliefs and ancestors having been taken you know very mm -hmm. very systematically and to to get to see you know zachary and his friends find their way despite that i mean in like you said you know zachary and is, is is chinese american and so there gets to be you give him a place in this book to be chinese american yeah that's what i wanted to do it's i wrote this book for the next generation of diaspora because i had a pretty tough time figuring out my identity when i was growing up so i just hope that they will have a smoother adolescence than mine mm -hmm. well it's books like these like that is going to make that happen and it's so clear like from page one that you were like this book is for Chinese children. Like this book is for yeah. Chinese American kids. Like, you know what I mean? Like this is who's being centered. And um, and that unapologetic, like, I, I just know like the first time that I picked up a book that was like very unapologetically like this is for black kids, this is for black American kids, et cetera. This is for black diasporic kids. Like that, even as an adult picking up those books to this day changes like my life consistently. Um, so I feel like this book absolutely is going to do exactly like what you set out and um it's really like w when you bring up that yeah like there are a lot of parallels to how zachary yin has has felt othered and how you um were othered as you know as a kid because there's a there's a, a quote one of my favorite quotes from the book where um it says zach's identity has always been a chore to explain to people but Simon and Melissa understood him without needing him to elaborate. It was as if he'd been drifting as a lone leaf for his whole life, only to have found the tree he'd come from. Why? <laughs> Not the tree. <laughs> Not the tree. This is so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. Like, and I, I feel that you're, you feel while reading this book that, um, 
that like you are writing, you feel who you're writing for, you know, that's, that's how I can say, especially with, um, with, with Aiden, you know, the book kind of opens up with, with Zach having a very different group of friends, you know, he, he's yeah. in a, a large, were all the kids white in, in the, you know, I they weren't all white, but I, I imagine it was like majority white. But yeah, I didn't really have time to like expand on that. But for sure, Zach was the only Asian kid in that group. And you know, it's Maine; it's like the whitest state. <laughs> That's why I chose it because it's the whitest state. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah that that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. that, that well, it was actually kind of kind of dope that they just disappear from the book. Right, like they're uh -huh. not a lot to be given. They're a small piece on his journey to becoming and to connecting with with a group of well, a, a small group of, of of Chinese friends who love and see him, and um, and that was kind of their place. And I just think that with it, it can I know it connected to me as like because it's kind of clear that Zach has a little bit of a crush on Aiden. Right. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. I'm so glad that you picked that up because like not many people do. And yeah, and it's like um, so many of us queer kids, queer brown kids, um, and queer immigrant kids have a crush on our white bully, and that's why we hang out with them. Like I know I had a crush on my white bully. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And so that's that's part of why you like put up with what you are, you know, what you go through with with that friend group is because you want to be liked, you want to be attractive, you know. And so it was really awesome to see how you were like absolutely not like no shame to, to kids who are still in that space but you were like absolutely not like you this is what you deserve you deserve a group of of friends who love and see you and know you and are gonna you know save the world with you oh yeah it is just gonna be zach's like really embarrassing sixth grade crush in the future he's gonna think back like oh god my tastes <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, it's okay. Aiden's gonna peak in high school, and then you know. I know exactly. It's <laughs> very clear. It's very very clear. Um. So so speaking of fun scenes in the novel, would you would you tell us what scene in Zachary and, and the Dragon Emperor was the most challenging to write, and which was the most fun? Okay. So can I get any spoilers here? How long have we been going? Uh, twenty two minutes. Let's go. I'll. We can ask this question towards the end. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll save that yeah, question yeah. because I feel like I do want to give. Yeah. Yeah. At the end, we can do. We can do some spoilers for sure. I was gonna. I was gonna ask you that before, but I just got so excited when I saw your face. Okay. <laughs> okay bet. So let me see if we had. Oh, also, um, any of y'all in the chat who have questions, feel free to start dropping them. Um, but I know, oh my gosh, see, my notes are just all over the place because I was a mad scientist when writing, when reading this book, I was just like, oh my gosh, I want to ask about this and I want to ask about that. Um, so, oh yes, we totally, can we please discuss the role, um, that historic heroes play in this book and, you know, you allow your history nerd to just shine. <laughs> you know um but why so i guess where we're going with this is one of the things that that i thought about while reading this book was how um you give so much com well they were complex but you give so much complexity to these historical characters and there's a lot of um kind of dialogue about how historical beings are either heroes or they're villains and you kind of assert that any any emperor, any conqueror, um, couldn't possibly be all quote unquote go good, and you challenge that like good bad dynamic. Um, would you speak on that at all? Yeah, I mean, if you're doing imperialism, you like inherently can't be a good person. Just um, and I think if you're in a leadership position at all, you always have to make uh, decisions that are morally questionable. So yeah, it's not really helpful to idolize any kind of leader. Like we shouldn't be idolizing any politicians. Politicians should be scared of the people and work for the people. So I honestly think that every government should be as scared of its people as like the French. <laughs> Mm. And yeah, so 
that's why I had that whole thing. Cause like, um, Zach was like, Oh my God, you're such a tyrant. And then, um, but the first emperor was like, well, like your American founding fathers were slave owners. So, and they don't teach you that in school. So whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I guess I, I just really enjoyed complicated characters, just like character complexity. So that's why I had Zach gain this like infamous tyrant as, um, like a travel adventure buddy. And so he slowly learns that, you know, um, the first emperor wasn't like all evil. He didn't do uh, what he did because he just wanted power. He like genuinely wanted to create a different world to like um, enact his vision upon the world. But also he was, he is very, very like morally questionable and a very self-centered. And he like does, he pushes his own viewpoint onto people. And when people say no to him, he just like, he freaks out. And he, he like, you do not say no to him. So he like, and then he just, schemes against you and mm -hmm. so yeah that's him and i wanted zach to come to terms with like that complexity in um in historical figures so that you know in the future he won't be idolizing historical figures randomly sure sure well so since chin shi huang was um zach's companion in this in, in this novel in terms of like you know they shared a mental connection if you yeah. will no i yeah um but he was one of one of many and so were what, what was your favorite you know uh emperor important historical being that you dragged into this novel to write about like who is your favorite I think it has to be the first emperor because he was so dramatic and there's so many like t hilarious stories about him that I didn't even like get to fit into the book. Like this one time he was climbing this like most sacred mountain in China in order to proclaim to the gods of what he done, like just like unifying the seven warring states. So he was like, yeah, I'm so great. Uh, gods hear me now. Look at me. I'm like the emperor of the whole world. And then after he like, when he was descending down the mountain suddenly this like gigantic rainstorm caught him and then he had to duck under this pine tree to for shelter and then after it passed he was like i am making this pine tree a rank five minister <laughs> so like he made that he gave that tree like an official position in his government and it's still mm -hmm. there you can like go see the tree and so that's the kind of stuff that he did he was just like completely he is very like like um un not self-aware i guess and he's just like he's living in a different world than everyone else so he's <laughs> he's like just hilarious in that way and that's mm -hmm. why you know i love to write about him because he mm -hmm. is like so easy to roast and he just like he he's he's so terrible but in mm -hmm. a funny way if you like you call for the humor mm. speaking of roasting don't think we didn't notice the line <laughs> where you were like, I forget who said it. I think it was, I think it was Simon, but he was like, yeah, you know, y'all Americans love Alexander the Great, but where's his empire now? <laughs> like, oh <my> God. <laughs> like, the first emperor was the only one who created something that lasted. And I was reading that line at, at, at a bar and I was like, <laughs> like. Oh, Love yeah. It. Yeah, the first emperor is just like, Alexander, Napoleon, haven't heard of them. Like, where are their empires? <laughs> Ooh, period. Yes, exactly. Like that, what was that? Uh, the Mariah Carey? I don't know her. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah you know? <laughs> yeah. It was, I don't it was, know them. Exactly. Exactly. It was a, it was a, a Bob moment. Um, so, I, so there's this idea that you cannot write, like, Oh, like wow, blockbuster level novels. If if you do not have a writing degree, um, <laughs> your face. And I feel that, like, I I know personally when um when I found out about your background, we were like, how you know? And so um, like the way that you have have found this really incredible writing style without having to have you know a traditional writing degree, which again, like you know the idea that you have to have a degree in order to write is, is ludicrous. But um, I feel like that's still, that's really, really still really, really inspiring. And so I was wondering, did you have, like, were you afraid to start writing not being like formally trained? 
Um, not really, because I started writing when I was 15. And then at that age, you're just like, oh, I'm the best person. I'm like the best writer in the world. I'm the best author. I'm going to like win so many awards. And so you just kind of have that like unfounded confidence. And then I had that. And that's what got me to start writing, even like my completely terrible first few novels. I was just like, this is the best thing ever. I don't need a writing degree. I'm going to get published in my teens, which I'm so glad did not happen because, you know, I, I don't think I could have handled the pressure of being published at that age. It's like I would have made a fool of myself and it would not have been great. <laughs> sure. Sure. So would you say that that's how you found your writing style just by just by writing as a kid? Yeah, and then just reading. And yes, mm. so the number one, the most helpful thing that I've ever done um, on my path to being published is reading way more recently published books and just seeing like um, what readers, what recent readers were like buying off the shelves and what publishers were like putting on there. And then like just reading books and then seeing what I liked. And then being like, I read every book nowadays. And then I think to myself, well, what did I like about that? What did I like that an author did? So basically I learned from every book um, and I'm just constantly reading more um, recently published stuff, which I think, yeah, is the most helpful thing you can do if you want to be published um, traditionally. Would you say, are you familiar with like the architect gardener writing style? I think kind of. And yeah, I used to be. So that's basically like another way of saying plotter versus panther, right? So yeah, I, used, yeah. I used to be a gardener. I used to just like let my story meander. And then mm -hmm. I realized that's not the most effective method. So I try to at least plot, um, get a like basic plot skeleton down before I start a story. I have to know the ending. I have to know the character arc the protagonist goes through. So mm -hmm. nowadays I try to be an architect even though it doesn't always work because like I, I like write I like fill in a bunch of my plot skeleton and then basically I start writing because ultimately it's going to change a lot. Mm -hmm. What um what authors are would you say that were were slash are like really influential on you or just authors that you really, really dig? Okay, I really dig uh, Lainey Taylor and mm -hmm. Kirsten White, with, who I met in San Diego like two days ago. I did an event with her, so that was amazing. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, I think the most formulative author though is uh, Lemony Snicket. I just, when I was young, younger, I couldn't get enough of his books. I just, I think he introduced like me to how, oh my God, you have the Zachary in. <laughs> The Zachary, um, oh my god, I forgot bottle. I forgot the word for bottle. Yeah, yeah, that too. It's actually a really great bottle because, um, it's really good at keeping um, temperature, actually. So, yeah, yes. Lemony Snicket, I loved how irreverent he was toward like usual, um, like conceptions about writing. He was just like, no, I'm gonna do my own thing, I will mm -hmm. fill like two whole pages with just like black ink if I want mm -hmm. to. So mm -hmm. I think he is where a lot of my irreverence comes from. But I also mm -hmm. he's heard, uh, heard he's racist, so we can't stand him anymore. Mm. That's unfortunate. That's yeah. definitely unfortunate. I know it ruined it ruined um our whole childhood when we found out that Roald Dahl was was not, yeah. not the dude that we thought he was. Although his history is like really fascinating. Did you know that he was like a honeypot in the war? What? Yeah, so apparently in in it, he was like a sex spy and just seduced like 200 plus women for information well, and, and then just wrote children's books. I mean, good good for him, I guess. I mean, that's, well, that's kind of... I guess I'm assuming women. Yeah. Mm. You know, men are easier to seduce, like just in general. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me see if we had any um any other questions besides the spoiler question that we wanted to touch upon. I think um yeah. Okay. So for uh for those of you who have not yet read Zachary and, and the Dragon Emperor, we are going to I I am going to ask a question that is is going to be spoilery. And um so if you want to stay like for the the Q and A after, I will put yourself on mute or put us on mute now, and I'll just like wave my hand when we're done, and then y'all can unmute. Okay, so 
So that was your warning. I'm going to slowly go into the question while y'all find your mute button. Okay, so the question was, what scene was the most fun and the most challenging to write? Okay, so the most challenging part of the novel was approximately two thirds of the way through after they have gone into the dragon palace and then they have got, been like taken captive by the dragon king. And at that point, I was really like, I don't know like what's gonna happen next. I don't know how to get them out of this conundrum. But then I thought to myself, um, I had to make it relevant to Zack's character arc. So I then that gave me the idea to have Zack um get them out of the conundrum by approaching the myth of the dragon king from his like fresh perspective as a diaspora learning about the myth for the first time because you know simon and melissa and the emperors they're approaching this uh dragon king with their very like ingrained view of how they should treat him like he's considered like um a total joke in myth but uh, in real life he has like totally honed his skills and become like a master of every like droplet of water in his kingdom so they, they're just he's just like holding them captive um he has basically like water kinesis and then he, they're just they're trapped and even the first emperor is like i don't know how to get us out of this situation uh if your water powers aren't working that well like if they're weaker than his i don't know come up with something and then so zach has the idea to like approach the dragon king with respect instead and like propose this like he, the, he gets into the psychology of what he is seeing as Dragon King, of this person who's been, like, so ridiculed and treated as a joke, and he's like, okay, we can make this an epic battle for the legend. Um, if if you release us and we, like, battle the eight immortals in, in, in like, over your realm, then it, this is going to be so much more epic. Just, like we will respect you like please and so zach is the one who gets them out of um the conundrum by with his fresh perspective and i think that mm -hmm. that's really fitting to his character art just like how he finds the confidence in who he is like he's not he's no longer ashamed because he doesn't know any of this he's like no i'm just i'm it's fine that i am learning this at my age because i can make contributions that you guys can't because of my fresh perspective mm -hmm. So that was the most challenging scene to write. Mm -hmm. um, and then the most fun scene to write, I'd, I would say that it has to be the like confrontation at the end in the first emperor's mausoleum, when mm -hmm. Zack is like, the first emperor unifies China and just like raises the first emperor's skull. And then the entire terror called an army in there comes to life. Cause that I think is the image that like uh, gave me the motivation to like, write this book all the way till the end because i wanted to write that scene because it's so vivid in my head and it's so epic that i just like wanted to do that so that was super fun to write that's hilarious that you were like i want to write this scene so i'm gonna write the book <laughs> yes exactly because like you Love see the terracotta one. army and then you're just like wouldn't it be so cool if they came back to life they're just begging to come back to life yes Yes, yes, we do love that. We do love what is what is I always forget. Is that technically necromancy? Technically? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We we do love some necromancy. Ign ignore I don't know what this the shadow situation is. So yeah. I'm I'm the dark realm right now, and we're just gonna have to live with it. Um oh wait, what waving. <laughs> yeah. Okay, friends. So spoiler time is over. Um we're going to we're gonna check out some of the darling questions that y'all have asked um question one will you write more middle grade books besides the zachary yin sequel in the future uh, probably i do i actually enjoy writing middle grade a lot more than uh ya well i will continue to write ya as well but middle grade just like i feel like it's a it's a lot more suited to my personality because i'm just like completely irreverent and like wacky and i love being able to have fun in middle grade so definitely i do have ideas already so we'll see lovely we we did think while reading zachary and we were really impressed that this was uh your first middle grade because in our opinion, middle grade is harder to write than adult. Um, really? Well, let me let me rephrase. For for us, yeah, way harder. Like it would be, it's so much easier for for me to write a piece of adult fiction than than middle grade fiction. And and we feel that that's the case because um, when you are an adult writing for kids, you have to make it believable. You the the language the the pace of the story um the ability to like tap into 
to let go of like your adult brain and just like really sink into um, a story that like a kid would just be enthralled by. Um, we think that that's, that's, that that's an art, you know, it, it's like, it's like reversion, you know, you're reverting back. And like you said, you're like, okay, well I am a kid. So <laughs> I know exactly. Like I am still at that phase of adulthood where I, I go to like a, like a, a, an amusement park or whatever. And then I see the child tickets and then the child tickets, it's like what I, what I like assume for myself first. I'm like, Oh my God, I only have to pay like $14. And then I remember that I'm a full grown adult and no, oh. I have to pay $17. <laughs> Are you also, are you short? I can't remember. I am 5'3", depends on if you consider that short. Uh, I'm 4'11". So- oh, What? I know, so what? this is, yep, yep. I'm I'm outing myself as, as a shorty. Everybody thinks that I'm like 5'9". No. I know, same. Okay, everybody <laughs> tells me that I have like tall person energy, whatever that is. But um, I am 5'3", which uh, actually I was going around the United States on my tour and I think I'm like average, I'm decent height, I'm average height, average height. Mm. I didn't like feel like I was too short too often, but still yeah. I am definitely intimidated by people over six foot. I'm just like, why can't I be you? I wish I had your height. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I once dated a woman who was 6'4", and looking back, I think I dated her because I just wanted to be 6'4". Oh my god, <laughs> yeah. Like, I was like, was that what that relationship was about? <laughs> uh, short people problems. My question, do you have plans to write books out of, out of the sci-fi fantasy genre? If so, will they still link back to Chinese mythology and history like your current novels? Mm, I'm not sure, just because, you know, um, I don't think writing contemporary is for me. I always have to have that element of, like, speculative fiction in there. Because, like, if you can't do wacky science fiction and fantasy stuff, then, like, why bother? And so uh, that's for me. Like, personally, I don't think so. I think the closest thing I would write to just, like non-sci-fi fantasy is historical fiction i could write mm. that just like completely stick to the facts and not have any trace of magic so i could do that and um with that of course i would uh I will link it to Chinese history. Mm -hmm. So it, there's that. I don't think I would ever write just like a completely contemporary thriller or something. Well, who knows? Maybe I always like, but the thing with me is that I always say, oh, I'll never write this. I'll never write that. Just like a few years ago, just like, I think I, as early as four years ago, I was like, oh, I I will never write a story with a Chinese protagonist because I think it'll be too self-indulgent. So that's what I was saying like four years ago. And now look at me. Now I'm like, I won't write any book that like doesn't have a Chinese protagonist. So, so we'll see. We'll see. But right now there are no plans. Pretty much like just gave BIPOC folk the the permission to indulge that's what i heard like, yeah self-indulgent that's what i heard you know as as you should like you deserve to be the set i mean you know you know you deserve to be the center of of a world yeah now i'm just like so shamelessly self-indulgent with my books and Love people Love like that so you know what i'll just keep doing it mm -hmm. honestly like you're a testament to what happens when you when you believe in your own mind you know yeah. like it's it's so true though like ugh. Um, oh, one thing I did want to ask really quick, would you ever give us a nonfiction book? Um, possibly. Um, I was thinking about like possibly writing nonfiction for Chinese mm. history, but still there's a lot on my plate already and that's, it's not a priority. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Question number two, do you see yourself writing slash publishing adult sci-fi one day? I definitely have plans, but it will depend whether when it will come out will really depend on when. Um, like I'm able to write finish all my other books, but um, once if I ever finish writing my like this this like idea of like um, killing Eve meets um, the pirate queen queen Chin Shi, it's like a lesbian. Uh, in space it's like a lesbian pirate queen in space who's like uh it's enemies to lovers with this like female general really like stoic stuck up female general who's like chasing her across the galaxy so it's like killing eve meets like chinji um uh, if i ever get to write that finish that book it's all over for you <laughs> all over for you oh my gosh it's over now what do you mean yes. like like what do you mean <laughs> That just, uh, okay, but here, here's our queer confession. 
We've not seen Killing Eve. Like, I know it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. We we know, like we know. Um, we just haven't seen it yet. It's okay, me neither. I'm using it as a cough, but me neither. Okay, mm-hmm. by the time I write it, hopefully I will have seen it. <laughs> right, right. Well, it would be a flex, though, to write it and not have seen it. I know, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Question, is there one or two books you've read recently yourself that you enjoyed and would recommend to others? Okay, so recently I read, so most of the books I read nowadays are um, advanced copies because mm-hmm. like I have a whole bunch of authors just like call, constantly sending me early copies of their book, which I'm super grateful about because mm-hmm. I'm just like, oh, I get to read this so early. And one book I really like was The Sunbearer Trials by Aiden Thomas. I think that book mm-hmm. is going to be so big. The world building in it blew my goddamn mind. And as for middle grade, though, I have a lot of, um, I have read a lot of like middle grade recently too. And it is so lit this year, middle grade, like 2022, middle grade, so lit. And some of my recommendations are Nura and the Immortal Palace. So it's mm-hmm. about this like girl, Micah Minor, who digs into this like, magical realm of gin and she has to like um and there are a bunch of other like minor kids trapped there as in like they, they mine stuff not that they're like young children but yeah it's it has a lot of discourse about just like child labor so that's like it's really heartbreaking but still she is so smart and like it's really empowering when she like she figures out how to like break all these kids out of this like realm of gin and so i love that and so yeah those are two recommendations i don't want to like get like overwhelm y'all too much but still, I mean, you I, could <laughs> yeah, so. you could uh quick question have you read gin city not yet uh I can't, i'm trying to remember the the author's name but it's only got like i swear it's got like 200 reviews on goodreads and it's one of the best books i've ever read it's amazing. Oh my God. There are so many good books that people are just sleeping on. Sleeping. It's yes. Um, and then the second thing we wanted to ask really quick, have you, um, have you read Nine Fox Gambit? I know it's on my to, uh, to read list, but I have not read it yet. Really, really, really think you would love that book. Um, there I were think elements. so too. Yeah, you, you will. And, and we feel like you'll get more out of it. We, um, we have uh, dyscalculia, um, which, if you're not familiar, is basically um, a learning disability where math, just like you can't do the math. Um, oh, yeah. So there's a lot of math in that book that we think uh, that went over our head that we think that would enhance the story for you. But the reason that we asked in particular is because um, in like in Zachary Yin, the main character, I think her name is Cherish, has um, she has a general in her head that is guiding her um and oh nice yeah 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 yeah. and like we i just i'm always uncomfortable comparing books by um like by authors of ethnic ethnic groups that i don't occupy you know what i mean like it just feels Mm -hmm. weird for me to be like oh your book reminds me of um of nine fox gambit but in terms of like that element um yeah when reading this book i was like oh like we really yeah so that's why we were curious so please read it (laughs) You're gonna love it. Oh yes, I will. It's on my list. Oh my my limber ending list. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's. Um, <laughs> I also thought the roasting of Western empires conquerors were pretty funny. It was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. The um the first emperor he was just like, oh my god, uh, I can't believe they don't consider me an A list conqueror. Just like my empire lasted a lot longer than those other hoes. Like, come on, I mm-hmm. am totally A list. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I was going to be like, I don't know why we didn't learn about him in school, but I know why. But it's yeah. just, like, so freaking cool. And it's just, it's really interesting because the um, the Chinese um, historical figures that we were taught about, they were cool, but they were not, like, they weren't the first emperor. It's just, it's so interesting. Like, by interesting, I mean, you know, shitty, the, the censorship. Yeah. The, you know. Oh, it's annoying. I mean, okay. which Chinese historical figures were you taught about? Because, like, if you talk Chinese history, you kind of can't get around the first emperor. Honestly, okay, so here is, um, here's our, we, we grew up in a small Dutch um, town called Holland. Like, literally, they went from Holland, and then they created Holland elsewhere. Oh my god, that's so lazy. 
Yeah. So even with slavery, we didn't know, for example, we didn't know how brutal slavery was in terms of like physical and sexual violence until we went to college in Minneapolis at 20. And we were shocked. We we had no idea that uh, slavery had sexual violence. We had no idea. Um, so that's, that is how like sheltered, my, like I think even among like sheltered kids in the US, like our education was shockingly sheltered. Yeah. So, um, and like, so yes. Yeah, so unfortunately I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you who I, I know we learned about Genghis Khan. Okay. Okay. You know, yeah. um, but like, it was just so passing. So I, I wouldn't even use my information or, you know, my upbringing as like an example of, of American, um, you know, like what kids are learning in school, because e I just, I've learned that like, even among other kids in the U S who like had really shitty, like historically censored, um, educations, so they're like, man, Jesse, I feel bad for you. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like, damn. You know, like, I didn't know who Malcolm X was until, um, I don't know, just some random person told me, like, I didn't learn about Malcolm X in school, basically. Like, that's how oh bad my it was. God. Yeah. Yeah. It, looking yeah, back. Yeah, I heard that the American education system is basically, um, MLK made a speech and then uh, racism ended. And that's, that's the end. Well, yep. <laughs> MLK made a speech and um, Abraham Lincoln stopped slavery. And <laughs> yeah, and then Rosa Parks sat on the bus and ended uh, racism for all, mm -hmm. for all time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ended racism for all time. Yeah. Okay. Um, question, since you now, since you've now, oh wait, we answered this one. Mm -hmm. um, ooh, love this one. Of all the characters you've written, which character would you like to spend time as? I think I would actually want to spend time as um as, as Zach just because I would make some very different decisions in his situation, and I will probably just like find a way to punch the first emperor in the face because <laughs> he deserves that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like um, it's funny like reading like the the first emperor as a character because I love him too much. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, you made him too fun. Like, this is your fault. <laughs> I know, right? But, like, no, we, we cannot stand this guy. And then Zach's just in a constant state of, like, oh, my God. That, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that is what's, like, I love how very intentional you were about that. Like, in the book, you were, like, this is not... This is not a character that we should be worshiping. You know I what know. I mean? I know. Zach's, like, what the hell is an A-list conqueror? Why are you proud of this? <laughs> yep. Yep that part your videos are so informative and incredible and fun how long does it take on average to research and film and edit your videos so about a week um i have to the script takes a few days to prepare and then i have to spend a whole day filming and editing editing always takes like way longer than i expect so i'm always late on um, my video deadlines because like once you get into like once you get sponsorships for youtube videos mm -hmm. they, they force you to do them on a schedule and then i'm always late i'm kind of like notorious for this <laughs> and so yeah always it always takes longer than i expect would you ever have like an editing team, like a production team? I am not sure because I'm like, I'm so um, particular about the way mm -hmm. I want my videos done. And then mm -hmm. also a lot of the information because I put um, information about the historical figures I'm talking about on screen, right? And I just don't know, like I will have to find a, like someone with an editor with like a lot of similar knowledge to me. And so I would like, I don't want them mm -hmm. to like put the wrong uh, historical figure on there or whatever. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't know. And also I think that editing myself makes me more responsible for my own schedule. Cause I am like finishing filming at like 2 AM and mm -hmm. I have to finish the video by like 10 AM. And mm -hmm. so I can't put that on anyone else. I can't just throw all this footage at someone else and be like, um, turn this around in eight hours. Only I can do that. I have to be responsible for my poor time, time management. Sure. Sure. Do you, how has, um, how has being on YouTube, your YouTube presence change? Not like how you, you know, conduct yourself, but in terms of like, what's different about being on YouTube now after you have written these two amazing books? It's, it's strange being a YouTuber. Um, just, uh, I think 
the main thing after like becoming a YouTuber is that I have become so chill. And um, people say that like fame changes you, but like the the way that like my D-list YouTuber fame has changed me was that it has made me so chill because I feel like it's just really hard to like develop an ego problem when like your main claim to fame is that you roasted a Mulan movie so you can't be like oh I'm so much better than the rest of you because of my opinions on Mulan so it, it's it's so ridiculous to me like my entire YouTube career it's just I cannot take it seriously just because it's just me roasting movies like why would I ever feel superior about that so that has made me so chill and then nowadays I like and I'm really glad that like that happened before I got published because if I got published um if I would just like my identity was just an author I think that I might be all like oh my god I am a published author uh like literary professional maybe I'll be like that but no now that I'm like a YouTuber I'm known as a YouTuber first and foremost it just mm -hmm. it's really hard to take myself too seriously so mm -hmm. I don't and that's I think a lot healthier and better mm -hmm. Yeah, YouTube can be pretty humbling. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> be pretty damn humbling. You know, which you know, which is which is a good thing, you know, in, mm -hmm. in our opinion. Um, so what if if anything about you know either of your books, but you know, Zachary Yin especially, do do you wish were do you feel that readers often miss? Uh, in Iron Widow, I feel like people often miss how shady Yi is, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of people just think of him because I describe him as pretty and stuff, so they think of him as just, like, this innocent cinema role and, like, the good one, but he's not. Like, in, like, his second conversation with Zutian, he's like, so, um, you, what if we just killed, like, this guy's family? Would that appease your rage? And so that's, he's, like, kind of really kind of messed up in the head and then I, that's i like drop hints very early on but some people just miss that and mm. i find that funny and, mm. and then in zachary and i think some people just completely miss the fact that he's gay even though that like the hints are everywhere everywhere but he's like he hasn't come to terms with his identity yet so he's yeah. just like oh i don't know but i don't like girls yeah yeah like in his defense even he seemed to miss it you know yeah i know right <laughs> which like, is oh, like, you. i don't think i'm gay i can't be gay Yep. I remember those days. I remember when my mom burst into my room. My mother is bisexual. She burst into my room at age 12 and she goes, are you gay? Oh and I was like, God. no, of, of, of course not, mother. Of course. And she's like, because if you're gay, that's cool. And I was like, nah, nah. And then later I was like, you know, in my 20s and I was like, I'm gay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? So like very, very excited to um, to see if you end up um how much of his queerness you end up like writing and, you know, and exploring um, in like the future books. Like it's just, it's always very interesting to, to see that arc. Like um, in Iron Widow, for example, I really felt that Zetian was, could potentially be non-binary or gender non-conforming. And so in the, you know, in Zachary Yin, where obviously it's a lot of time has passed yeah. And she has a presence in that book, but, you know, identifies like as a woman and like uses she, her. Um, so I was like, okay, that's not that you can't be non-binary and, and, you know, do those things. But um, it's just like really interesting to see, where am I going with this? I had a coherent point and then it just went downhill. Like the different depictions of the same historical figure. Does, yeah, Zotian is definitely, I think that, you know, if she had the word, the concept of like being non-binary, she would use that. But um, okay. it's a little bit more complicated in Chinese because like in Chinese, pronouns all sound the same. It's just ta. So it's right. kind of like written differently, but in spoken mm -hmm. language, it's it just it's the same pronoun for everyone. Mm -hmm. Sure. If, um, so I'm going to throw something out there and uh, no need to engage with it. Uh, if you don't want to, but I know for, for us personally, um, being non-binary and, and being black and, um, having multiplicity, the term non-binary doesn't feel, um, right. It's like the thing that I can say so that people know what I'm talking about, but like mm -hmm. in terms of like the concept of non-binary in the, the language of it and the way that it's expected to show up with the Westerners, with, you know, folks in the United States, um, doesn't feel right for me and like my, you know, Afro Mexican 
um, ancestral skinned body. Yeah. And so I was wondering, just because you had talked about how, like, yeah, if she had had that language or whatever, if if you have any, um, if you identify with that at all, with, like, I... does that make sense? Yes, it does, because I think that, honestly, I, like, this is, it may sound super weird, but I honestly think that my, like, my concept of my gender differs depending on the language that's being used. Like, oh, which, mm. like um, in Chinese, since Chinese is, like, not a gendered language at all, I mm. feel just, like, a lot more comfortable, and it's, it's like, everything is fine. I don't need to, like, just, I don't feel the need to stress that I am non-binary because, you know, mm. everything is, like, not gendered already. And then mm. um, in French, I really... I, I am indifferent toward the current non-binary language that's being proposed. So honestly, in French, I'm fine with just being like using the masculine terms because mm -hmm. uh, because they seem like more comf more comfortable for me. Because in French, mm -hmm. everything gets like to make something. It seems that like male is the default, and then the endings get changed when you want to make something feminine. So mm -hmm. I'm just like, well, don't, just don't do that for me then. Just just make it um, make it male. But that's I'm not a yeah. French speaker, so maybe mm -hmm. that's it's different from. Well, I'm not a French native speaker. I do have Canadian high school level French, but right. uh, right. so maybe native French speakers will um, think of it as different. But in French, I feel like you know if you want to use masculine terms. Um, conjugation for me that's fine that's fine but in English I'm like definitely um they them that's what makes me more comfortable so it almost seems like my gender is different in different languages just because of like the way those languages approach gender sure yep that makes sense my pronouns are definitely different in when I'm speaking Spanish with native Mexicans and with my family you know um so that makes total sense sorry my dog brought a toy and I'm obligated to entertain Aww. her <laughs> Um, okay, so let's see. I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I'm going to see if we've missed any questions, and then we'll wrap up. Um, what is this one? Oh, speaking of time, how long do you, your makeup looks take for your videos, Insta posts? They're absolutely stunning. And how long have you been practicing makeup? So this depends on how heavy of a makeup I want to go. Usually, if it's a light look, it takes about an hour. If it's a like a more dramatic look, probably two hours and um so yeah that's and uh how long have i been practicing makeup so since i was a teenager and i was really into the cosplay community mm -hmm. and i think i yeah i learned all of my makeup skills from cosplay mm -hmm. and also drag race i'm just like i i've loved drag race since season four so oh did not know that about you awesome awesome are there any um can you give us like either a sneak peek or just throw out some names of um characters that you would like to cosplay someday oh god i don't know currently i don't have any plans i really oh no i actually i do have plans to go as yusei fudo from um Yu -Gi -Oh! 5ds at some point uh, but I'm so busy that I'm not able to make cosplays anymore and it's actually like it's made me sad because I had to um I think this was like a few weeks ago where I came to terms with how like I am never gonna have time to like make cosplays myself again if I do go into um do cosplay again then I'm, I'm gonna hire someone else to make it because I yeah I just don't have time for like the handicrafts that I used to do so I I very like sadly threw out a lot of my construction stuff ah uh, and sure, yeah sure. but it's you know it's it's understandable. It's understandable. And maybe one day, like, yes, it might be this way for the next five years, but maybe, you know, maybe one day it'll be different. Yeah, maybe. There's just so much I want to do and so little time. Preach. Preach. Um, so I think I think this is a good stopping point unless there is more that you want to unpack or. Yeah, I think that's everything. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, so, yeah, like very, very, very honored that you were in conversation um with us and and more importantly that you that you wrote this amazing wonderful book the uh the purchase link to this book is in the description along with um shiran's youtube if you for some reason aren't subscribed yeah. um but yeah that's that's gotta do it thank you again for for what you do and and for being in this wild chaotic world as yourself <laughs> Yeah, thank you for inviting me. This has been so much fun. Of course. Of course. Okay, y'all. Thank you for being present with us. Stay safe. Um, be good to yourself. Be good to others. And we will see you later.
Bye-bye. Bye.